Good morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone, and welcome to Global Insights, a live interactive weekly panel discussions which sheds light on big questions currently facing researchers, policymakers, and planners worldwide. Global Insights features experts from uh, many different in, in, uh, institutions of international affairs, including the Balsillie School of International Affairs in Canada, the American University in Washington, D.C., Constance University in Germany, and Warwick University in the U.K., and the Institute for Strategic Affairs in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Today's live stream session is entitled COVID-19 and the Global South. My name is Anne Fitzgerald. I'm the director of the Balsili School of International Affairs and I've been, I'm delighted to be moderating today's session. A warm welcome to all participants in the audience and there are many of you today. We would ask you to direct any questions you may have for panelists directly to the Q&A function on the Zoom panel and we will do our best to channel these questions to the appropriate panelists, particularly in the last part of the session. We are privileged today to host six well-known experts in, uh, on issues related to the Global South. Jonathan Crush is a former CG Chair in Global Migration and Development and a 2018 Research Chair at the Balsili School of International Affairs, Wilfrid Laurier University. He is the director of the Balsili School's Hungry Research, Hungry Cities Partnership, which is a global research and policy network focused on rapid urbanization and food system transformation in the global south. Shirin Rai is a professor of international political economy in the Department of Politics and International Studies at Warwick University. She is also the director of Warwick's Interdisciplinary Research Center for International Development. Her research interests lie in the area of feminist politics, gender and political institutions and global development. Bryony Jones is an associate professor of international development in the politics and international studies department at Warwick University. She is also the deputy director of War the Warwick Interdisciplinary Research Center for International Development. Her research takes place at the intersection between justice, development and peace building with a particular focus on the politics of interventions in societies dealing with violations of human rights. Hallelujah Luli is head of the Institute for Strategic Affairs, a leading policy think tank in the field of political, security and foreign policy based in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. His research focuses on nation building, democratization, peace and security in the Horn of Africa. Anya Osai hails from the Department of Politics and Public Administration at the University of Konstanz in Germany. Her research focuses on democratization and electoral authoritarianism, especially political institutions like parliaments. Rachel Sullivan Robinson is an associate professor at the School of International Service, the American University in Washington, DC. Rachel is a sociologist and demographer who studies global health interventions with a focus on NGOs, HIV, reproductive health, and LGBTQ issues. I'd like to kick off today's session with a big question, and I'd like to start with Professor Jonathan Crush. Jonathan, in what ways does the pandemic in the global south differ from what we've seen with the pandemic in the north, particularly in North America and Europe? Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Anne. Um, I'd say the most striking difference between the global north and the global south at the present time uh, is that the north has a serious pandemic, while the south apparently does not or good parts of it don't. Uh, over 80% of confirmed cases of COVID-19 and more than 90% of fatalities are in the north. Uh, the whole of Africa with its 1.2 billion people has less than 50,000 confirmed cases and 2,000 fatalities. That's actually less than Canada, uh, which has 62,000 uh, cases and 4,000 fatalities. So the question is, I mean, does this mean that the South is somehow immune as some have actually speculated, pointing to youthful populations and mass uh, BCG inoculation. I think this position as sort of the equivalent of standing in Times Square in mid-March and wondering what it was about the US that gave it immunity from the pandemic ravaging Europe. And we all know how that turned out. Uh, most public health experts agree that the coronavirus is now spreading rapidly in the South as recent data from Latin America tends to confirm. Uh, 
modeling on the um, African situation projects a peak in September with a minimum actually of 300,000 uh, fatalities in a best case scenario. There's also a serious under detection problem in Africa. And researchers recently calculated that South Africa's official COVID prevalence is around uh, 7,000. The actual number of infections is really somewhere between 50 and 250,000. So just summing up, um, the difference between the pandemic in the North and the South is actually more apparent than real. It's really just a matter of testing and timing. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Rachel Sullivan Robinson, your views on this issue. Thank you, Anne. Um, I think one of the interesting differences between the Global North and the Global South at this point is that countries in the Global South really have a lot more experience dealing with infectious pandemic diseases. Uh, this is true as true of for individual people and families and populations as it is for health ministries and other bureaucracies, um, HIV, Ebola, malaria. Uh, and these experiences can provide some benefits. Uh, when we consider the case of Ebola, countries learned how to promote wide-scale hand washing, contact tracing, airport screening. Uh, for example, Nigeria was already screening airport passengers in February, uh, so long before anything like that was happening in the US. Uh, since Ebola, the African Centers for Disease Control and the West African Surveillance Division capacity have increased in terms of trafficking epidemic disease. And then there's many, many technocrats across countries who are infectious disease experts in a way that you just do not have in wealthy countries today. At the same time, as we'll touch on many times today, I'm sure uh, countries in general have extraordinarily weak health systems, and that remains very concerning. Thanks very much. Hallelujah, Luli from Addis Ababa. What are your views on this? Uh, well, I mean, I would like to build on what uh, Rachel, Rachel has already mentioned. For, for example, you know, issues of malaria, TB, and HIV AIDS uh, have, uh, have been you know, the biggest threat for public health on the continent. And in some countries, including Ethiopia, you know, uh, uh, they build a refined health infrastructure. For example, in Ethiopia, there is the health extension program involving uh, around 50,000 uh, um, health extension workers. And that infrastructure is being used, for example, for house to house stressing uh, of mm -hmm. uh, this uh, COVID crisis. Uh, but, but still, uh, you know, the, uh, the overall uh, health system is still ill-equipped from the perspective of, you know, having proper, uh, you know, testing kits, proper, you know, uh, expertise and laboratories. And uh, most importantly, you know, doctors are I mean, uh, in short supply in most, uh, in most remote places on the, con I mean, uh, on the continent. So um, we've not, I mean, the, the continent I mean, has a very fragile and weak health system, even though some of the infrastructure built to tackle, you know, the conventional health challenges like TB, malaria, and HIV could be used as, uh, as a, uh, to respond to uh, this crisis. Thanks very much. Shirin Rai from Warwick. I think um, a lot of uh, my colleagues have already mentioned the, um, the health um, infrastructure, but also the social infrastructure, which is sort of, you know, providing people with a welfare system, which is robust enough to sustain um, sort of, you know, pressure from, from uh, these crises is very little. And so that brings me to really the question of how is this going to affect people in the global south, how, whatever the numbers. Right. And in that, what we are finding is that poor, although poorer nations have tended to bring in stricter measures earlier. So, for example, I, when I came back from India after six months of living there, my friends were really worried about me coming back to the UK because the, the stringency of, of uh, lockdown in Delhi compared to what we are experiencing here. But at the same time, uh, the severity of um, uh, the, the crisis is going to be largely felt in the economic sphere, I think, very differently. Um, and I think I worry about that because, for example, since the beginning of the crisis, investors have removed 100 billion uh, US dollars from emerging markets already, 
So what is, how are we going to manage that in context where the economy is already not weak, sorry, not strong enough to sustain a, a strong welfare state for the most vulnerable in our, in our societies? Thanks very much. Anya Osai from Constance. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Um, before speaking about the differences, I would say that there is a challenge or dilemma that confronts all governments in the world right now. So this is on the one hand, the contagion of the spread of the virus, which might need quite strict measures like lockdowns and restrictions of civil liberties. Um, and at the same time, protecting livelihoods and maintaining social cohesion. And there's no easy and no perfect way to do both at the same time. So governments have to strike a balance, but the ability to do so depends on a number of factors like state capacity, social security and welfare systems, the health system, as other people have already said, but also the strength of institutions, regime type, the quality of democracy, and of course, government legitimacy. Uh, from the Afrobarometer survey, we know that there's quite low trust in political institutions in many African countries. So this affects or this, this has a great influence on government's ability to manage the crisis. And it also affects the willingness of people to actually comply with the measures. So this is a great challenge that confronts all governments, but it is influenced by different factors in the North and the South. Thanks very much. Bryony Jones from Warwick. Yes, thank you, Anne. I would just add as a compliment to the comments made so far that it's important to highlight that, of course, we're not seeing one Global South, one set of experiences and one set of responses. And I think generalizations are, are very helpful in terms of thinking through the health burdens in the global south and also the resources required by the health systems, not least because it will allow us to galvanize appropriate multilateral action and to redistribute resources where they're required. But we see, particularly in media in the global north, some uh, problematic tropes that are being repeated around the global south as a kind of one block, an inability to cope, for example. And I think it's important in, in all of our discussions and particularly when it comes to policy making on the issue to sustain this delicate balance between on the one hand generalizations which are vital for action and support and on the, on the other hand capturing what's quite complex variations within the global south as well as the global north and I think we'll touch on that obviously as our conversation continues. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much Bryony. Let's get some views on um, the direct effect of the COVID pandemic uh, in the north on the south. So how is this pandemic affecting the south? Jonathan, um, we've already got some queries coming in on issues such as FDI, ODA remittances. Can you comment on any of those things? Yeah, I'll uh, I'll comment on the on the third on remittances. Um, you know, uh, there are over 250 million migrants in the world um, who collectively remitted over uh, 600 billion US last year to their home countries. Uh, more than half of these are located in uh, Europe and North American countries. So mass unemployment layoffs and so on are having a direct impact on the earning capacity of migrants and therefore on remittances which are critical to livelihoods, to food security and to access to health and education in many parts of the global south. Uh, in the 2007-8 financial crisis remittances fell by 7% but they soon recovered and then continued to grow. Um, the World Bank's now estimating this year alone there'll be a 20% fall so I think this is going to be a major, uh, it's going to have a major impact on the global south uh, with all of the negative consequences for households and communities that this will entail. Thank you. Hallelujah. View from, um, uh, why don't we get your view from Addis Ababa, please? Um, I think, uh, you know, the, uh, the corona crisis uh, in, the, in the global north, in the west, and the subsequent economic crisis that's looming. Uh, actually, we have already seen the damage in many places. 
serious impact on the commitment from the international community to PCN security uh, developments and commitments on the continent. For example, a number of peacekeeping missions across uh, the African continent, they are highly dependent on the support, the financial and logistical support from, from the North. So uh, most of them were witnessing significant shortage in funding and commitment in the past few years. Some were struggling, some were even reducing the number of peacekeeping and reducing their mandate uh, and operations. So uh, I believe uh, we've already seen you know, uh, a decline uh, in, the, in, in this commitment, uh, the political commitment, but the economic commitment, I believe, uh, the decline in resources and logistical support for this peacekeeping missions and political processes could pose a significant security challenge for, the, for Africa. Thanks very much. Shirin Rai, any views on this? Yes, I think my first uh, worry is about whether, uh, what will be the impact of the crisis on um, international aid? Um, so, you know, will, for example, the 0.7% commitments that many countries have, you know, towards um, uh, international aid would come under pressure or indeed um, it might sort of illustrate uh, how important that aid is. There's been a lot of talk in the UK about how the aid money that has been spent over the last three or you know, last um, three, four years is actually going to be, and the consequences of that have, are going to be eroded under the crisis. And so does it really? I mean, the question could be when your own economy needs so much support from the state, can the UK government continue to? And I hope very much that, of course, that that doesn't happen and that this commitment remains. In fact, for me, obviously, it illustrates the importance of international aid at times of crisis. The second thing, of course, which is really important, and um, I would echo what Bryony um, Jones said earlier about the crisis affects different parts of the world differently, but also people within the countries differently. So as we have seen again in the United States, uh, again in India, countries like India or the UK, race, gender and um, sort of ethnicity matter a great deal. So how people are being affected by this. So if, for example, there's a drop in demand in the global north for goods and services. Jonathan has already mentioned migration flows, but also, of course, it is about the goods that uh, we need to think about. So as of, um, and, uh, as of the 2nd of April, more than a million garment workers in Bangladesh alone have been sent home without pay, without social protection, after major clothing brands withdrew or canceled or suspended $3.17 billion worth of orders. Now, what happens to these women, right? These, and largely these factory, you know, textile factories involves, um, uh, employs women. So what happens to them? What happens to their families as they go? Will they go back? We are seeing a lot of this distress migration from cities back to the countryside, and that will generate its own pressures. And I think finally, uh, I just want to, and maybe Bryony will say something more about that, but the closing of our borders is not only going to have the effect on remittances that Jonathan has mentioned, but also in terms of people fleeing, uh, fleeing uh, persecution. Um, and so where, where do they go? How do they go? We know what's happening in Greece in terms of Lesbos and the conditions and Syria uh, conditions in, in um, camps. So I think it's a very worrying time for, for us just now. Thanks, Sharon. Anya Osai, you're, you're an expert on elections. Um, we anticipate many of those uh, across the South uh, in the forthcoming months. Any views on this? Yes, of course, um, elections are crucial to democratization and many countries in the global South are democratizing. Um, but elections are very, very difficult to organize during the pandemic. So you might think about the proper organization of the process, voter turnout, um, counting of ballots, but also election observation and campaigning. So this might impact on the credibility of the whole process and on the results. 
So if the process is difficult to organize, it might be less credible and that might raise contradictions after the elections. But on the other hand, postponing elections due to the crisis can also become a welcome tool for heads of states that do not want to leave office and that do not want to be challenged and just take the opportunity to, to benefit from that. So this might aggravate already existing authoritarian tendencies. And it's not only about elections, but when we look at the impact of the crisis on the global south, we also have to talk about um, the economic crisis and a, a political and economic crisis simultaneously can create dissatisfaction and this can really pose a challenge to governments. When we think, for example, about the downfall of oil prices, we also have to think about how this impacts on oil producing countries in the Middle East, but also on fragile states like Nigeria, where political legitimacy is to a large extent dependent on oil revenues. And when we look at those countries, they are at risk. And not only the countries are at risk, when we think about Iran, Saudi Arabia, the whole region of the Middle East, then this is also a risk, not for individual countries, for individuals in the countries, but also a regional risk. And this can lead to political crisis, but also to civil wars and also to regional crisis. Thanks very much. Rachel Sullivan Robinson, any views from Washington? Yeah, I think, I mean, particularly in terms of Washington, I think one of the impacts is reduced U.S. support for international institutions in particular. I mean, we see that with the Trump administration's efforts to defund the World Health Organization, but it's going to further justify, COVID is going to further justify uh, defunding development assistance in general and particularly for health. Um, it's also then giving populations within wealthy countries more justification and rationale for isolationism, which is just not, not beneficial. And then it also enables some troubling trends in sort of neo-colonial approaches to global health, for example, that permit the North to gobble up all of the PPE that exists in the world, as well as, you know, suggest running drug and vaccine trials in countries of the global South. I'd like to pitch a question on the response taken by the Global South to the pandemic um, and ask the question, what are we learning from it? I have to say, I was um, going through Addis Ababa Airport and Accra Airport in late February, and I thought there was a pretty slick, effective um, operation going on in both airports uh, in contrast to what I then came back to, to the North to. So um, put the first question to Bryony Jones, please. Yes, thanks. I, th I think following my earlier comments, you've seen a variety of responses. Um, and if we take Africa as an example, we have had some quick um, action by governments, South Africa, Kenya, Rwanda, for example, and some slow responses from, say, the government of Tanzania, which has come under fire from the World Health Organization. Um, the Secretary General of the United Nations a few days ago was lamenting uh, a lack of leadership. Um, in terms of response to the pandemic, and in particular connecting that to the overlap of leadership and power, um, and of course critiquing the US-China response to uh, a UN coordinated response. Um, but I think we can look to some African context for leadership in how to respond to this, and in particular, um, the African Center for Security Studies has outlined some really innovative approaches that have been taken, presidential task forces which have been set up with groups uh, foregrounding professionals coming from different disciplinary backgrounds, including but not limited to health, and using these to mobilize the sharing of lessons learned and best practices around, say, mobile testing um, and mobile monitoring and evaluation. So I think there are some really concrete um, programs which we can be learning from. Great. Rachel, as a health governance expert, what are you seeing? I would definitely echo Bryony's points. Um, there's, you know, huge variation in countries' responses. Uh, some of it really driven by history. So, you know, some countries simply have better resources to address health challenges. But again, it's not always resources in the sense of, um, you know, just finances. 
So if you think about Brazil with this amazing public health system that comes out of a long-term history of uh, activism for the right to health, um, that system appears to be helping overcome failures in political leadership by ensuring you know, as much health care as possible. Uh, similarly, if you think about community health workers, which are, uh, have been helpful in Brazil, but also in places like South Africa, where you know, they're keeping, they, they helped vaccinate everyone against the flu this year, so that there's fewer people in hospitals with influenza, therefore leaving more beds for people with COVID. Uh, and then also this approach in South, South Africa, this kind of active case finding approach. So some really interesting examples where these pre-existing resources help explain differences in what countries can do. Thank you. Jonathan Crush, any views on this? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's nothing like a pandemic and a crisis to um, lay certain things bare. And I think one of the things that I would just point to uh, is the way in which governments in the South uh, have responded to the existence of um, very large informal sector in, uh, in cities. Um, I mean, informal employment in many African countries is over 80% of the workforce. And governments have traditionally taken quite a dim view of the informal sector and tend to pathologize and criminalize it uh, and exercise tight spatial control uh, at, at the very least. And I think the initial response of, uh, of, of a number of governments to the, the advent of coronavirus uh, was actually to try and shut down the informal sector um, because it was seen as a, as a sort of potential hotspot for transmission um, and, and, and have actually had to reverse the, that, that position pretty quickly when it became evident that the informal uh, food sector in particular was critical to food security of populations. So I feel that you know, there's certainly much more need for research and constructive policy dialogue going forward uh, about the importance of informality. Thanks very much. Atto, hallelujah. Give us your view on this. The, um, of course, I'm in the global south at time to take lessons from you know, the, the trends and patterns of the crisis uh, in the global north. But, Two things are different. Of course, many of the participants have been highlighting the different format of the economy in the South. For example, to give an example, in, in Addis Ababa, the capital of one of the biggest cities on the continent, you know, the around 40% of the economy, uh, almost half of the economy is informal. Uh, and the response could not be, you know, I mean, uh, I mean the global South has taken lessons and has you know, uh, has seen, I mean, the, the impact, the devastating impact of the, the crisis on the North. But the first, the, the, the social and economic infrastructure and structure is very different. Uh, it's difficult, for example, to apply lockdown in, a, in places, in big cities where um, there's no running water, there's no, uh, you know, the, there, there are no refrigerators or people don't have savings to, to buy stocks. And people have to go out every day to work and to, I mean, uh, to bring that to the, to, to, you know, to the table. And uh, that has somehow, uh, you know, complicated the response. But the other factor is the fact that, I mean, the, as it was mentioned by uh, some of the previous speakers, you know, the, the numbers are still deceiving in Africa. Uh, it looks like, you know, the, the, I mean, the, uh, it looks like a, uh, you know, a calm before a big storm. But initially there was a shock and some attempts were uh, done by, uh, some, some, some countries on the continent, like in Zimbabwe or South Africa or in Kenya, uh, they created some kind of strong discontent, social discontent. And we've also witnessed the possibility of, you know, uh, social unrest and riots. For example, to give you one example, in South Africa, you know, in the first few days of the lockdown, uh, three people were killed by the police uh, when they were trying to enforce the lockdown. That equaled, at that period, the number of people who died of COVID. So, you know, the, the response uh, in some places was perceived by many much more painful than uh, the problem. 
Thanks very much. Um, to all of you, many countries at the moment in the Global South are pursuing far-reaching democratization agenda. Uh, could COVID-19 impact on these agenda? And I'll start with Shirin Rai, please. Yes, I think what we are seeing uh, is uh, really the increased role of the state um, in all, whether Global North or the Global South, in responding to this crisis. Um, in, through direct transfers, through financial support to the market, through furlough schemes. So I think that this is something that will be quite interesting to chart as to what the impact of um, this sort of the state stepping in in this way um, is in the long term. I think it can go, there's a lot of um, uh, positive kind of noise in the background in terms of, oh, well, this shows that, you know, we cannot go back to free marketing and neoliberal policies. The state is here to stay. It really needs, but I think it actually could go either way. We have to be very careful. This is a liminal moment where things could either go you know, uh, in one direction or the other. So take, for example, the kind of xenophobic and populist policies that we have uh, also seen evidence of. Uh, closing of borders could, might uh, sort of enhance those. Uh, feelings that um, we have had um, attacks upon Chinese citizens in the US, um, bullying of Chinese children in the UK. So that sense of uh, xenophobia could it actually increase uh, very much. Now, but at the same time, it could also be that collectivist uh, progressive political uh, approaches win out because we can now demonstrate how important the state is to rectify market signals to sort of, you know, ensure that the market doesn't allow people who are vulnerable to um, um, uh, fall through. And so I think that this is not something that um, uh, democracy is really going to be tested now at this stage, whether it is the global south or the global north. And I worry also about countries like sort of, you know, in India, we've had uh, a real targeting of uh, the Muslim population because of one little incident um, uh, where there was a Muslim um, uh, meeting that was allowed to go ahead. And then I think sort of, you know, we need, and that India is a democratic state. It's a stable democratic state. It's just Delhi where this meeting took place had a really uh, strong election just recently. So we need to be careful that crises are not mobilized by the state either to shut down democratic critique in the name of urgency. We need to guard against this, uh, but at the same time to also see how we can come together to maybe um, challenge that approach. Thank you. Anya Osai, is this a crisis for democratization? Um, partly. So I, I agree with what Shirin has already said. Um, and in Hungary, we already see how the parliament is disempowered and how media freedom is uh, restricted and how critical media is silenced. So there is a real danger that authoritarian leaders use the crisis to extend their powers. So freedoms and civil liberties that are taken away due to the emergency must also be brought back. And there is no guarantee that it, it will come that way. Right now, it's more difficult for opposition groups to organize protest. And it's also more difficult for civil society to fulfill its role as a watchdog. And thinking of a worst case, under lockdown, you might face a situation where a government is severely mismanaging the crisis and you cannot mobilize dissent into political alternatives just because civil liberties are restricted due to the crisis. So this can have negative consequences in the more fragile democratizing countries. It might also have a an effect in post-conflict societies. So when you are not able to politically manage the discontent and the dissatisfaction, this could give room to violent non-democratic actors. So we have to be very, very careful about the situation. However, um, we should not be too pessimistic because at the same time, 
governments that manage the crisis well might also gain legitimacy. Um, so I just read a quite encouraging study from Senegal, which found that more than 80% were of the population were actually suffering from the economic conditions due to lockdown. But at the same time, more than 80% approved of the government measures and were also ready to comply with it. So I think we need more research on how people actually perceive the situation and how satisfied they are at the moment with their governments. Thank you. Rachel, is this crisis illuminating issues of inequality in your view? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll mention just a few ways that are directly related to health, but I, I think they feed back into the types of um, broader structural factors that my fellow panelists were just mentioning. One is gender related. So we know that there's been increases in domestic and violence, uh, that access to contraception and abortion decreases within the context and uh, that you know increases gender inequality. The other is in terms of sexuality. So authoritarian governments, particularly given a moment of crisis, have increased ability to target sexual and gender minorities, putting them at much greater risk for HIV and sexually transmitted infections all the while, while the specialized clinics and health services offered through community organizations are suffering at this point in time. And then we know, of course, that other infectious diseases, HIV, malaria, tuberculosis, are all expected to worsen as people have difficulty accessing medication, surveillance is reduced, health workers are pulled into other tasks. So these, uh, these can, you know, these inequalities can increase, but in relationship to democratization, they may also provide a powerful rallying cry for people to demand more from government. So it's very difficult to identify which direction things might go. Thank you very much. Hallelujah, Luli. We've talked about the democratization agenda. What about the security agenda? There are lots of far-reaching security sector reform agenda across the global south. Um, do you see COVID-19 having an impact on these or any heavier handed responses to security? I mean, uh, the, I mean, apparently it is the state that has the mandate, the capacity, uh, and the resources to respond to such a uh, crisis of such magnitude. So in many places, of course, as some of the speakers have uh, rightly highlighted, it will put the state uh, at the forefront of public life. Uh, so it will embolden and further strengthen the role of the state in society. And uh, in some, you know, in some cases, it may, uh, you know, it may, uh, you know, uh, it may create problems and challenges for existing democratization processes and transitions on the, across across the continent. Uh, but in some instances, it could be it could also be used as a, a rallying point, a unifying point, because the corona crisis has created a warlike situation. And uh, so they may demand national consensus, national unity, uh, and they may also create a rallying under the flag effect, the state at the lead. So uh, uh, most the opposition and uh, you know, the government may agree on how to fight uh, this crisis in some places. And that could, in my, in my opinion, in some place on the continent, be used as an entry point for a wide and comprehensive national consensus and national dialogue platforms that can actually further uh, consolidate uh, democratization processes. Uh, but in some place like, for example, in Sudan, for example, which is passing through a democratic process, the democratic transition, uh, you know, the, the crisis has put a lot of, uh, I mean, a lot of stress uh, on the country's already fragile and uh, worsening economy situation and threatening the whole uh, transition. So it's, 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 it's a bit mixed. Thanks very much. Jonathan Crush, we've got uh, questions coming in on food security. How is this impacting on food security? Yeah, I don't know if uh, some of you may have seen the um, um, front page story in the New York Times on the uh, weekend under the banner, a uh, food crisis worsens. And, and that actually suggests that there was a crisis and that it's actually um, deteriorating as a result of COVID-19. Um, and indeed, that is the case. I mean, um, in 2019, the FAO estimated 
that almost 2 billion people globally were either moderately or severely uh, food insecure. Um, and lockdowns and so on have disrupted supply chains, uh, cross-border trade and foodstuffs, uh, reduced access to income to purchase food, and increased food insecurity amongst the most vulnerable. Um, we've been doing research for hungry cities in uh, Wuhan and Nanjing. And this is clearly showing that even in cities with actually a high degree of pre-existing food security, uh, households under lockdown experience significant increases in food insecurity. So I think it's quite correct for the FAO to recently label uh, COVID-19 a crisis within a crisis. And the World Food Programs called it actually a hunger pandemic. Uh, it's warning that about 30 million people could die of starvation and the number of severely food insecure could double. So if you take uh, the second hunger pandemic along with the economic carnage, um, it's uh, to combined, they're actually forcing states to relax their restrictions uh, actually long before the COVID pand pandemic itself uh, has been brought under control. Thanks very much. Um, Bryony Jones, any justice related issues you can comment on? Yes, thank you. I think as we've been hearing um, from the comments of my co-panelists, it's obviously a health crisis at the moment, but it's more than that. It's also a crisis of human rights, crisis of justice, of security in many forms. And many of the measures that have been um, used to enforce confinement or lockdowns, curfews, are in themselves potential fig leaves for human rights abuses, or might indeed be abuses themselves. Um, and so what we see is that the, the current pandemic is actually potentially going to widen what's been identified as the justice gap. So last year, the task force for justice already identified that globally 1.5 billion people um, live with a justice problem that they can't resolve and 4.5 billion live without the opportunities that the law um, offers. And so what we really need to see, I think, is a much more coordinated response between justice actors. So that includes local communities, um, government, um, the private sector, international organizations, to have firstly an independent scrutiny of the measures that are being put in place to enforce responses to the, the health crisis. Um, secondly, to try and secure safe zones or safe areas in places that we know are violent or conflict hotspots. Um, and lastly, to try and generate um, much more effective people-centered data. So to find out much more about what's required or needed by individuals in terms of their justice, security, and human rights um, as we respond in an ongoing fashion to the crisis and many of the, the ongoing effects that Jonathan has most recently just mentioned in his response. Thank you very much. And as ever during a crisis, um, we, we hear a lot about worrying trends, a lot uh, of, of doom and gloom issues. I'd like to put a question to all of you as to what you think has worked well and what would you um, uh, see as, 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 as some really important lessons that we have used uh, both in the North and South and something that the South with early warning could grab hold of and use. Jonathan Crush. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and you know, um, the Western media tends to portray people in the South as hapless victims of COVID-19. Uh, whether they be images of migrants walking thousands of kilometers in India or uh, being arrested and tear gassed by the army for breaking curfews like in uh, South Africa or being locked down in overcrowded dormitories in Singapore. Uh, I, it's my feeling that much greater attention and credit and support needs to be given to civil society organizations uh, who are active agents in mobilizing uh, and collecting and distributing food uh, and actually in highlighting human rights violations by overzealous enforcers. Uh, just one quick example, um, the initial um, regulations under the Disaster Act in South Africa essentially banned all informal sector uh, activity, but it was through the mobilization of civil society, informal traders, organizations, and so on, that the government quickly backtracked, recognized the importance, and 
started to open up that sector. Great, thank you. Anyo Sai, any, any uh, good uh, things that we have seen so far that we can help socialize and discuss as well? I think for my field of spe specialization, so democracy, it's too early to tell. It's, it's just not possible to say what has worked well and what has not worked well because we are too early into the situation to really give an assessment. But I agree with what Jonathan has said. So we should not just look at governments and, and uh, state responses, but also look to civil society actors. I was talking about the lack of trust in security forces, in political leaders. But at the same time, from the Afrobarometer, we know that there are actors that have a considerable uh, level of trust, traditional leaders, religious leaders, and I think to build a consensus around what needs to be done and how coercive measures and can be counterbalanced with uh, protecting livelihoods. We have to see how to incorporate wider segments of the society, traditional leaders, religious leaders, civil society, in order to build a consensus to protect the social, uh, the social um, cohesion in states, especially in fragile states. Thank you. Uh, Rachel, uh, we've got a lot of questions coming in from the audience about uh, your views on Africa's capacity to support global health security more generally. So what do you see as working and uh, as being labeled as a good experience thus far? And what, what, what are your views on this? Um, I think the first thing which is global is clear, consistent and accurate public health messaging. Uh, and in particular messaging that addresses people's fears and misconceptions head on, as opposed to just the sort of, you know, tech, the technical, here's how you wash your hands, those types of things. Uh, places that have community health workers in place have been able to put them to very good use in a variety of ways. And then civil society organizations, echoing what panelists have said, I mean, some specific examples, um, the Center for Development and Democracy in Nigeria, they've been putting out uh, flyers about how to dispel myths about how COVID is spread and how people can protect themselves. SEGS, an organization in Guatemala, um, promotes the use of community health defenders who have you know, an innovative technique for ensuring people's health rights. There's efforts by an organization called Follow the Money, also in West Africa, uh, tracking donor funds uh, being targeted specifically towards COVID. So there's lots of practical things that organizations that already exist can do to help literally increase global health security. Thank you. Shirin Rai, any comments, please? Yes, I think sort of, you know, two things come to mind straight away. One is in the field of health, I should suppose I shouldn't be sort of, you know, Rachel has already mentioned this, but just that some countries seem to have been able to um, trace and track or track and trace whichever <laughs> way um, um, and, and then therefore have a much more um, focused way of isolating people and therefore sort of, you know, not, not clamp downs which are unprepared for like it happened in India and the consequences of that. So that I think has been quite good. Um, if I was going to, to um, think about those countries in which empathy has played a lot of role in communicating very clearly, but also uh, gently as to why it is important, then we have also seen that many countries where women are leaders have come, you know, have, have had that much better than the militarized and war, war language of crisis in other parts of the world. So that's one. The second thing I would say is that it's the furlough schemes, which many countries are running now, um, which have been really important, not just in terms of pay, you know, ensuring that, that people uh, don't starve or don't uh, sort of feel, get unemployed because companies cannot keep, uh, keep them on, but also the reassurance that goes, uh, which is really important for society to feel that not everybody around them is losing their jobs and therefore bring up the anxieties that a crisis can. Thank you very much. Um, hallelujah, Luli. Lots of questions coming in on uh, institutions in the Global South. Do you see this as an opportunity for the African Union to initiate reforms or other regional organizations in Africa? 
Uh, you know, the Ebola crisis uh, we, had, we experienced a few years ago uh, resulted in the creation and formation of the Continental Disease Control and Prevention Institute, the CDC, the African CDC. Uh, and of course, the creation of that organization, that organ of the African Union was a success by itself, but not much funding and political support was put behind it in the past six, seven years. So I believe now uh, there will be a rethink of you know, how to uh, embolden you know, that, uh, that organ of the African Union. But at the same time, you know, uh, you know, not only at the regional organizations level, but at the state level as well, the issue of uh, human rights from the perspective of economic and social rights has become a dominant topic in most countries across the continent, especially when there were debates surrounding the possible lockdown. Uh, many countries like you know, Kenya, Zimbabwe, South Africa, uh, the political and public spheres were dominated by debates and conversations if their economic and social uh, structures are low, you know, uh, a lockdown. So I believe uh, you know, economic and social rights will be included in uh, the political uh, agenda, the political debates, both at the national levels, but even at the, at the African Union, because the regional organization, the African Union, invested most of its money, its energy and commitment on the security agenda in the, past, uh, in the past almost two decades. Now I think there is, this is an indicator, this is a push, there's a push that the African Union should invest more on social and health issues and I believe it's time to reform the African Union CDC. Thanks very much. Jonathan Crush, can I take a question back to you? There are questions coming in about what Shirin Rai said about ODA uh, likely to fall due to COVID and what is going to be the impact? What does this mean for nutrition intervention programs that aim to alleviate the incredibly high rates of malnutrition um, uh, in South Asia, Africa and elsewhere? Um, do we expect countries to increase domestic air, uh, efforts to, to curb malnutrition? What do you think the impact is going to be, particularly with regards to ODA? Well, um, it's an interesting question because when one looks at, at ODA uh, in relation to food and, and nutrition, um, it's primarily directed towards the common perception uh, that food, food insecurity is a, is a rural problem in the global south and a lot of the targeted programs uh, are focused on um, you know trying to raise production uh, and um, particularly among smallholders so i think one could definitely see uh, if there's a drop in oda that that's going to be affected uh, of course what won't be necessarily affected by that uh, are the large populations increasing in number uh, who are moving to the cities um, and who really have to uh, make their own way when it comes to access to food. Uh, and um, it's, it's a, it's, that is the crisis uh, that we see increasingly. And I don't honestly see that the way that ODA is structured, uh, it's going to uh, have much impact there. Thank you. Shirin Rai, um, what does this mean for the future of international development policy? Um, will we see some big ideas of the past uh, come to fruition again? No, I think that is a really important question and, and something that we'll all struggle with in the next few um, few years really to come. I think some of the big ideas um, are already there in the SDGs that we can, uh, re I'd like to revisit. So um, one is the importance of social care and social care networks when we are faced with such pandemics. So the recognizing the value of social care means also, so SDG 5 and SDG 5.4 in particular talks about the importance of care work, right, as work. And we need to recognize the importance of that in these um, circumstances as a result of, of what we are witnessing now. For example, 83% of the workforce uh, in terms of care of the, in the broadest sense um, are typically women. So you need to understand the political economy or a, a gendered political economy um, 
and, and recognize the importance of that. That group of people is doing typically every day because of um, schools, you know, Bryony's children are being homeschooled, um, sort of, you know, uh, et cetera, is that typically women are doing two hours more work on top of what they were already doing as a result, direct result of this. So we need to recognize that. The second thing I think is um, also the importance of investing in social infrastructure. Very often when unemployment hits, the Keynesian model kicks in with the uh, male breadwinner model at the heart of it. We, and therefore um, sort of, you know, we don't have um, enough in, uh, investment in social infrastructure which is health, social care, um, schooling, et cetera. And I think we need to think about that. Finally, I think one of the things, uh, an argument that is coming up really strongly is should this alert us to the importance of universal basic income and in, in addition to that, universal basic services, which everyone should have access to as the bottom line so that everybody is secure, at least to a certain extent. So I think those would be the three things I would say. Thanks very much. And I'd like to direct the last question from the audience to Anya. Um, it's, there's a lot of interest in the Q&A about elections and um, the delay of elections uh, being directly related to constitutional term limits. Can you comment on any of that? So the issue of constitutional term limits and they have been abandoned in some countries, uh, not respected, constitutions have been changed, has been there before the crisis. So the crisis, the COVID crisis is only bringing to light some of the problems that are already there. And um, as I said, elections are crucial to democratization, but they are very, very difficult to hold under these circumstances. So countries in which elections are scheduled will have to find ways to either organize the elections in the current context or to postpone them. Both has its very important limitations and also so, some dangers. Um, I think the, the development of democracy is um, an ongoing process and uh, COVID is not, so, so COVID is, is uh, one of the, let me say, one of the critical junctures where we see where the development will go. But I don't think that we can at the moment say what the crisis will do, but these are processes that are already there, authoritarian processes that have been already there. They are just aggra aggravated by the crisis. Thanks very much. Bryony Jones, um, I want to wrap up with a final question uh, to all panel, um, and that is, if you, um, if you had a suite of policymakers in front of you now, what would be your best recommendation to them? Yeah, thank you, and thanks for the interesting discussion. Uh, three things, I think, from my side. Uh, the first is that the response needs to be explicitly interdisciplinary. Um, as we've seen from this panel and from the comments, it's a health crisis, but it goes beyond that. So efforts that are brought together, inputs from different disciplines have been incredibly important. Um, the second is that it needs to be people-centered policy response. We need better data from people about their needs, their fears, their experiences in the contexts of their daily lives. And lastly, I think one of the emphasis that's been in the policy discussions is about building resilience, not only to the current pandemic wave, but also a fear about resilience for future waves that may or may not happen. And I think when we're, when we're talking about resilience in a policy context, it's important to think, again, is it being complex beyond health, interdisciplinary version of resilience, but also that it's not just the responsibility of the individual, um, but it's something that needs coordinated in action between the individual, the local community, national governments, and also international response as well. Rachel, can you give us a 15 second pitch to policymakers? Yes. Uh, so fund scientific research, data collection, and bureaucratic capacity, both at home and in developing countries. So the African CDC, health ministries, and statistical agencies. And then remember that even when there is a vaccine, that does not mean that we will be able to get it to everyone and that we need to address everything that makes that so difficult.
Thanks very much. Hallelujah. What's your message? Uh, my three recommendations would be first, depoliticize the response to the COVID crisis. And second, uh, use this opportunity to create national consensus and national dialogue and to create a broad based coalition to address uh, underlying structural challenges, both in politics and economics. Uh, and third, build a strong social welfare system to respond to, uh, you know, the, uh, to the crisis and the economic and social impact of the crisis. Thank you so much. I think we have run out of time, but I'm sure you will all agree that that was a great panel. Thank you to all six panelists for sharing your compelling insights on a very timely and relevant uh, subject. Please join us next week um, for an equally exciting session entitled COVID-19 implications for climate change and new energy structures. Same time, same link, same day. Thank you to all of you. Take care and stay safe.